Um, again, I'm Dale Christensio. I'm the Director of Stakeholder Engagement at FDA, and I will be your host and moderator this morning. Um, thank you for joining us for today's call regarding the COVID-19 testing issues. Um, joining us today is our Acting Commissioner, Dr. Janet Wilcock. Many of you have known her for many years, and also our Center for Devices and Radiological Health Director, Dr. Jeff Shuren. Um, both of us um, are on the both of them are on the call with us today, and both will make remarks. After which, we will open up the call to questions and answers. Um, participants will be in a listen-only mode uh, until we open up the call for questions. And if you're interested in asking a question, you can do so either by raising your hand, which will put you in the queue, and then I'll call on you, or by typing your question into the chat function at the bottom of your screen. And please remember to state your name and organization um, as you are typing in your question or announcing yourself so that we know where you're from. And with those housekeeping announcements, I'd now like to turn the call over to Dr. Woodcock for opening remarks. Thank you, Dale, and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for an update on FDA's recent work on COVID-19 testing. I ask our team to pull this call together so we could reach a broad group of our stakeholders and provide an update on our recent work, as well as provide an opportunity to directly answer some of your questions. Engaging with uh, stakeholders such as you regularly during the course of this pandemic to hear about what's happening on the ground uh, from our public health community has been immensely important to FDA and help guide us. I'm looking forward to this dialogue. As I stepped into the role of acting commissioner in January, I came really with a laser focus on supporting the work that FDA's career staff are continuing to do and have done in response to the pandemic. And I'm committed to doing everything I can to support the regulatory programs we're entrusted with to carry out this response. As many of you know, over the past nine months, I've been working on the previous administration's Operation Warp Speed on development of certain therapeutics for COVID-19, but I have certainly been in the loop on the work within the testing arena as well, because of course that's critical to the whole thing, whether you use a therapeutic and so forth. <clears throat> Throughout the pandemic, FDA centers have really worked tirelessly to bring uh, medical products quickly to the market while continuing to evaluate their safety and effectiveness. And really, the Center for Devices has been particularly busy over the past year in the diagnostic space and other spaces as well. As of the last week, 332 tests and sample collection devices have FDA emergency use authorizations or EUAs. These include 248 molecular tests and sample collection devices, 70 antibody tests, 14 antigen tests. And for molecular tests, <clears throat> we've authorized 37 home collection, 20 pooling, 14 asymptomatic screening, 13 multi-analyte, and 10 point of care. And actually, we're, these numbers probably have been updated this morning. Also one molecular prescription at home test, one antigen prescription at home test, and one over the counter at home antigen test. So this is a real broad panoply of uh, testing uh, devices that can be used in a wide variety of situations. Our goal is to continue to support innovation and testing and providing flexibility to test developers with the aim of increasing the availability of both accurate and reliable tests for all Americans. FDA review of the performance and claims of these tests is important to protect individuals and public health. People risk unknowingly spreading uh, the virus or not getting treated appropriately if they use a test that does not perform as it should. Now, I think there is a great interest in variants Last week, FDA issued three guidances for medical product developers, specifically covering vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics to address the emergence and what the future might hold with emergence of variants of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. These guidances uh, will provide efficient ways to modify medical products that are either in the pipeline or have been authorized for emergency use to address these emerging variants and mutations. 
we continue to work to use every tool in our toolbox uh, to fight this pandemic, including the fact that we may need to pivot uh, as the virus adapts. FDA has already issued a safety alert to caution that the presence of virus genetic mutations in a patient sample can potentially change the performance of a diagnostic test. And we've identified a few tests that are known to be impacted by emerging virus mutations. Although at this time, the impact does not appear to be significant. Now we know, however, that it could be um, in the future and this needs to be monitored. So the guidance on the impact of virus mutations for COVID-19 tests also outlines FDA's recommendations to test developers and our work also to monitor the impact that new variants may be having on test performance. As acting commissioner, I want to assure everyone that the process and review for the diagnostics will be as open and transparent as possible. The decisions FDA will make in the coming weeks and months with regard for new tests for COVID-19, new therapeutics, and new vaccines, as happened over the weekend, will continue to be based on good science and sound data, not on politics. And these decisions will be made by the dedicated career staff at FDA through our thorough review processes. The public health work you're doing to respond to COVID is so important. I would love to hear more about what you're hearing on the ground, as well as discuss ways we can further collaborate. So with that, I'll turn this over to Dr. Sharon for any opening comments he may have. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, everyone, living in the virtual world. Well, welcome. And thank you, Dr. Woodcock. Thank you all of you for participating today. At CDRH, we are deeply committed to facilitating access to accurate and reliable tests for all Americans. As you heard from Dr. Woodcock, since the start of the pandemic, the FDA has authorized over 330 tests and collection kits for a variety of uses, users, and locations to provide a wide array of test options. And that's nearly one test every day during the public health emergency. FDA employees have been working around the clock to authorize tests as quickly as possible. And in the beginning of the pandemic, when we had far fewer submissions, authorizing over a dozen tests in as little as 24 hours or less and others in two or three days. And this includes tests that can be performed at point of care and more recently tests that can be performed at home. In fact, just this morning, we authorized Quidel's quick view test for at-home use with a prescription. This is the fourth at-home test authorized by the FDA and there are more in the pipeline. In addition, We've been collaborating with the National Institutes of Health on their RADx program to help facilitate the development, evaluation, and authorization of tests for point of care or at home, or that can increase testing capacity. But we continue to seek ways to provide useful information to and work with test developers. And we also continue to work with states, educational institutions, businesses, sports leagues, and others who are establishing or seek to establish testing programs and have questions about particular tests or test options. Since the start of the pandemic, CDRH has issued guidances and eight emergency use authorization templates with recommendations for how developers can validate different tests and uses of tests, as well as several updates to some of these guidances and templates. For medical devices as a whole, we've issued 27 guidances and 11 EUA templates. We also have a pre-emergency use authorization process or pre-EUA as we call it, and through which test developers can interact with center experts in real or near real time through emails and phone calls, as well as submit data for review on a rolling basis. And so far we have received over 950 pre-EUAs and over 1,800 original EUA requests for tests alone. And that's out of over 5,000 pre-EUAs and EUA requests received for all medical devices combined. And to date, we have granted emergency use authorization to over 680 medical devices and cleared more than another 400 devices through a 510K program. In all, authorizing on average three medical devices, including tests, 
every day for the past year. And this is in addition to receiving over 16,000 submissions for non-COVID technologies in 2020. Now, given the significant increase in workload and that we are in a different stage of the pandemic than we were at at the beginning, we have been prioritizing the review of tests that increase patient access, such as point of care and at home tests, and those that significantly increase testing capacity, such as widely distributed high throughput tests and cooling. We also engage with test developers through weekly town halls that started the first week of March, 2020. And to date, we have hosted 45 of them. And we post on a website and continually update our frequently asked questions. In addition, we establish multiple mailboxes to receive and rapidly respond to questions. In addition to a 24 hour hotline we ran for much of the spring. To date, we've received almost 400,000 telephone and email queries about medical technologies, including tests throughout this public health emergency. Moreover, we continue to monitor the performance of tests post authorization through studies, reporting of performance problems, leveraging real-world evidence sources, and the use of a reference panel developed by the FDA to assess the relative performance of molecular diagnostic tests. When problems have been identified with test performance or results, we have issued safety communications to inform and offer recommendations to healthcare providers and laboratories to reduce the risk of false results. We also continue to actively monitor for any firm's marketing tests with fraudulent COVID-19 claims and have sent warning letters, confiscated counterfeit products, and pursued enforcement action against bad actors and bad products being marketed unlawfully. As Dr. Woodcock mentioned, last week the FDA issued a new guidance on evaluating the potential impact of emerging and future viral genetic mutations, which may be the basis of viral variants on COVID-19 tests including design considerations and ongoing monitoring. The guidance describes the FDA's activities to better understand the public health impact of new virus variants through their impact on test performance, such as monitoring publicly available genomic databases for emerging SARS-CoV-2 genetic mutations and identifying authorized molecular tests whose performance may be adversely affected by one or more of those mutations, which is something we've been doing throughout the pandemic. The guidance also highlights recommendations to test developers, such as considering the potential for future genetic mutations when designing their tests and conducting their own routine monitoring to evaluate the potential impact of new and emerging viral genetic mutations, which may be the bearers of viral variants on the performance of molecular, antigen, and serology SARS-CoV-2 tests. As part of this effort, we're also working with other partners to develop or identify tools that may help developers, including a bioinformatics tool to assist molecular test developers in identifying whether the test performance may be adversely impacted by a new mutation or combination of mutations. Now looking ahead, CDRH intends to issue draft guidance to put forward an approach for transitioning authorized medical devices, including tests, to full marketing authorization if the developer wants to do so. And we'll seek public comment so that all stakeholders have an opportunity to provide feedback before we finalize the guidance. While FDA cannot release details on the guidance and development, we don't envision a transition that occurs at a flip of the switch and would anticipate a transition period that will phase in over a period of time to allow sponsors to meet any additional requirements. However, we also encourage sponsors of authorized tests and other medical technologies who wish to keep their products on the market long-term to seek full marketing authorization sooner rather than later. And we're exploring opportunities to issue to the public our recommendations for the data needed to supplement what has already been submitted in an EU request to support full marketing authorization. And in the interim, interested sponsors should talk with us about what to do, including how they may leverage existing data sources. 
So with that, I'll say thank you, and now I'll turn it back over to Dale. Thank you so much, Dr. Sharon and Dr. Woodcock. And um, this now uh, turns us to the question and answer portion of the event. If um, you would like to ask a question, you can raise your hand at the bottom. Um, I am not seeing any questions yet. Oh, here's one um, from Jennifer Dexter, who is with the National Health Council. Um, I'm gonna um, see Jennifer, if you wanna ask your question live or I can read it for you. Okay, I, I just wanted to, to get some insight from you on how the patient community can help advance data collection and on usage and demographics so that um, all of it truly uh, reflects their experience. Do you have any advice on that? I think I'll turn that to Dr. Sharon for diagnostics. All right. You know, it is a great question. I think it's going to also take on significantly more pro uh, prominence as we have more at-home tests that are available in the marketplace. So many of those tests offer an opportunity to provide test results and other information. And I do think the patient community lending their voice out there more publicly to uh, try to convey to those users of tests to please report that data in. And that is going to places like the Department of Health and Human Services and other public health departments to better inform our response to COVID-19 that information, too, can help us better understand what is the true uh, performance characteristics of tests out on the marketplace. Great. Thank you so much for that question, Jennifer. Um, Dr. Sharon, I have another question for you. Um, can you explain the difference between screening, surveillance, and a diagnostic test? Well, certainly. Back to the basics. So the basics are in a, in a diagnostic test, is looking at individuals typically who are suspected of having COVID-19. It's a much more targeted look and you're giving results back to the individual. In the case of screening, um, you're just looking broadly at asymptomatic individuals. You otherwise don't have a suspicion that they have COVID-19 uh, and you're performing a test in them. And then surveillance is really much more of a populational look. What's happening out in a defined uh, population or community to understand particularly what the prevalence may be of SARS-CoV-2. And in those circumstances, that's more about the population and typically results are not communicated back to individuals. Although if you get a positive result, uh, it's important to let that individual know to go ahead and get an authorized, get another test performed with an authorized diagnostic. And it's also important to keep in mind that the performance of a test can vary depending upon how common SARS-CoV-2 may be in a population. So when it's more prevalent, more likely to get accurate result, you know, correct results. And as that prevalence goes down, you may see changes in performance. We have also seen that you may have different performance between individuals suspected of having COVID-19, particularly those who are symptomatic versus those who are truly asymptomatic, not suspected, what you would consider classic screening. And we've seen data where sometimes the test performance is different. If you are thinking about using a test that is authorized for diagnostic purpose, but um, a healthcare provider wishes to order it for screening purposes, that's perfectly okay to do and a very rational thing to do. But just keep in mind, when we authorize a test, we do it based upon what the test developer wants to have that test used for and what the science supports. So many times we may authorize a test just for diagnostic purposes because the developer didn't seek a screening claim or didn't provide evidence. If we get data though, where we know there's a problem with screening, we would include that in the labeling. But that said, even if we authorize a diagnostic and it may be used for screening purposes, Keep in mind, we haven't seen the data to see how it performs in screening. And that's one of the reasons why too, just understand what the limitations may be when you take that into account with interpreting the patient's results. Great, thank you. The next question is in the queue from Jonathan Mile. Jonathan, you can ask. Thank you. Um, can you folks hear me? 
Okay, great, great. Um, good day, everybody. And um, I wanna thank everybody at the agency for your service. I'm Dr. Jonathan Miles, I'm a pathologist and I'm representing the College of American Pathologists. We have several questions, but I'm gonna pick two which we hear the most of from our members. One is will the FDA resume evaluating laboratory developed tests for emergency use authorization? And second, um, does the FDA anticipate prioritizing SARS-CoV-2 quantitative tests since clinicians are increasingly asking about the CT values? Be interested in your opinion on that. Thank you. Uh, well, as regards uh, laboratory developed tests, um, I know there's been a lot of questions about it, a lot of interest. Uh, certainly, as you know, the uh, Biden administration is now putting uh, key people in place in the administration. More people are coming into the Department of Health and Human Services. And we look forward to having a conversation with the administration on this very important topic. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and this is Janet. I'm say, Janet Woodcock. It's a very high priority for us to get clarity, um, but we we need to work with the new administration to have clarity on the on the direction. Yeah. And then, uh, certainly, when it comes, you know, to to quantitative, um, certainly uh, it is you can report the results. A laboratory can report cycle threshold values. Um, we have certainly seen on the flip side to keep in mind the caveats that um, cycle threshold values uh, between uh, two different tests can mean different things. And we've also seen um, the same cycle threshold uh, for the same test performed in different laboratories also having uh, different meanings too. So, you know, cycle thresholds, um, may provide some information, but also there are important limitations as well. Thank you. Great, thank you for that. Um, the next question we have comes from the chat from Glenn Hansen. He asked, can you provide us with a list of the six ICD-10 codes and which one do you recommend for asymptomatic screening and or back to workplace strategies? Dr. Sharon. So that is that is so far out of my realm. Yeah. I, I can't I can't give you uh, any advice on that. It's really a question for uh, for the payers. Great. Thank you for that. All right. I'll move on to another question that we've received a few times um, in house. Um, we see that. Um, review priorities were posted by CDRH in the fall of 2020, Dr. Sharon. How did you determine priorities and what is an expected timeline for review of some of these products? That's a good question. And you know, as I mentioned too, we did change um, our priorities. In the beginning of the pandemic, it was essentially all comers. Anyone coming in the door, um, tests were being, EUAs were being reviewed and we were just authorizing what came through to build up greater testing capacity. Um, and as time went by, we started to then see tests hitting the marketplace, moving towards point of care, and of course, more recently to at home. We made changes in our prioritization uh, several months ago when we hit a different stage in the pandemic. There were a lot more tests out there, but I think a greater, we thought a greater need to then focus with the large volume on those tests that it could increase patient access and in particular, point of care and at home. And also, those tests that were going to increase testing capacity. So as I mentioned, the high volume, high throughput tests, pooling. We're also looking at tests that may reduce the strain on the testing supply chain as well, because we know that's one of the challenges as well. You may have tests, but you may not have the test supplies needed in order to run those tests. And that's where we have put our um, our primary focus, of course, the review, the bottom line is, if we get a complete EUA and the data looks good, we authorize that very quickly. 
where things have taken more time is either we never got a completed EUA, so we're still waiting on data, or we've identified some issues in what has been submitted. We don't have those assurances. We have an accurate, reliable test. And we will go back and give the opportunity for a developer uh, to go ahead and provide or address those unresolved uh, issues. Great. Um, the next question I have is for Dr. Woodcock. Dr. Woodcock, we've seen a lot of focus on the vaccines and in um, the pandemic, but can you talk a little bit about what you would you would tell the American public on the importance of testing? Well, testing um, diagnosis in general is a foundation of medicine. Uh, and for this pandemic, uh, testing is going to be the way that we control it. Uh, it also, uh, along with the vaccines. So the vaccines will not um, prevent every transmission of the virus or every acquisition of disease. So we're going to need accurate and frequent testing, I think for the foreseeable future, to see where we are with uh, the effectiveness of the vaccines, as well as uh, how much uh, freedom to move around we should have in society. And eventually will help us, if we can get the numbers way down, into contact uh, tracing and other methods of uh, infection control that we really can't use now because we have so many cases. So really um, testing hasn't taken the forefront that vaccines have because if pe people want to be personally protected, but testing is really the foundation of all our efforts. Great, thank you. Jeff, do you have anything to add to that before we move on to the next question? Oh, I, I completely agree with Dr. Whitcock. Um, critically important, uh, and it's going to remain important for the foreseeable future uh, for the pandemic. Great, thank you. I have one more question um, for Dr. Shuren in the queue, um, and it, it's actually related to the announcement that was made this morning on the at-home at test that mm -hmm. um, was just authorized. You know, what features is CDRH looking for in, in these at-home test applications, especially and how we continue to track cases with results um, being generated at home. Uh, what we look for is generally what we look for in tests to begin with. Um, namely, are they gonna be accurate, reliable, mm -hmm. and can they be used by the intended users and the results understood by them? Mm -hmm. uh, you can apply obviously for lab-based, you've got experts. So, uh, you know, a lot of confidence their ability to use as you get to point of care, healthcare professionals, we always double check to make sure that they can use it properly and get accurate test results, know what to do with the results. Same thing goes when you move at home. It's a different community. It's now the consumer. Just make sure that they're able to use it and they're able to then uh, understand the results that are, that are provided. Um, we also look at, you know, the performance characteristics. One of the things we made very clear is that um, while we accept a lower level of sensitivity for tests that are used point of care and at home than we do for lab-based tests, kind of a trade-off for greater access, we'd also accept even lower sensitivity, but to do so with appropriate mitigation, such as a serial testing strategy and then validate the test using that particular strategy. Now, in terms of reporting test results, we do not require that there are built-in capabilities in at-home tests for reporting. We did not want to put on a requirement for those additional technological needs so that we did not hold up development of those tests. That said, many of the developers are providing different mechanisms by which the consumer can report those results, such as through um, an app that can read the results and then give the consumer the opportunity to report it. Uh, another one the prescription is with uh, a teledoc service, another way of getting the result yeah. and to report it. So um, a lot of, um, you know, innovation and reporting, and I will just to harp on this point, say this is one of the silver linings that we're seeing out of COVID-19. I think in the future, we're going to see a greater emphasis on the development of tests for point of care and at home. And we at the FDA, we're already thinking about that and how we can put sort of the technological 
you know, platforms to make this easier in the future and move uh, more care to the home setting. And also those technological innovations that allow for the results to be easily communicated at the discretion of the, of the consumer. Uh, and that really is going to be the future. And we're taking advantage of the COVID-19 landscape to both push that out and to be better prepared in the future. Great. And um, there's a follow-up question to that comment, which is regarding approval of at-home tests, what is the consideration of consulting with providers such as pharmacists for follow-up referrals, et cetera? Is the prescription requirement standard? Um, so the answer is no. It is up to the developer if they wish to seek um, a, a, a prescription at-home test or an over-the-counter at home test up to them and then uh, for them to provide the evidence to support that particular use. We do know that uh, many of the developers who are thinking about or have moved to um, at home testing, oftentimes they've looked at point of care. They've kind of done a bit of a progression before they've moved to at home and certainly for uh, over the counter. But up to the developer and we at the FDA, we can't compel developers to either make a test, the technology they use, what the test is used for, or even the price. I know people always ask, can we have more lower price tests? Love to see more lower price tests, but we, uh, we can't, make the, can't make them do it. And this is Janet, to earlier points, of course, uh, widespread use of at-home testing will require, as somebody said earlier, the uh, more patient activism and so forth, if the pandemic is receding, we're going to still need to understand um, as best we can uh, the incidence of infections. And so uh, uh, patients and consumers reporting through various means will be important. Great. Okay, I have another question from Jonathan Miles in the chat. He asks, are labs required to obtain an EUA if they offer genomic sequencing panels? Yeah, so it, um, it uh, well, labs. So is, are we talking about a laboratory developed test? You know, a test they have developed in their laboratory just for use in the laboratory? I'm uh, assuming, but I don't know for sure. Uh, I'm seeing yes, I think in the chat room, is that right? So yes, yes, this is caught up if we're talking about a laboratory developed tests again, um, you know, that is there are lots of questions about uh, the opportunities in the future and you know what uh, oversight may look like. And again, uh, that's really a conversation uh, looking forward to have with the, with the current administration. Great. Well, I have no further questions in the chat um, and there aren't any other hands raised. So I thought I would just open it up um, for last closing comments um, from you, Dr. Sharon and Dr. Woodcock before we say goodbye. Jeff, you want to go first? Um, I will let you are, you are the, you are the commissioner. So. I'm okay. <laughs> right. Well, it's very good talking to you all. We want to maintain close ties and communicate what we know as fast as we know it to the people on the ground. Also hear from you about what the ongoing issues are. So we hope to keep up this dialogue. As you heard from Dr. Sharon, more guidance will be coming out. There may be additional um, movement or changes. There definitely will be new technologies and so forth. And so we just need to uh, remain um, closely uh, in communication and hopefully over the next few months we're going to see some light at the end of the tunnel and we're we'll talking about a changed environment out there so uh, we're looking forward to that should it occur thank you uh, well that is well said and uh, the only thing i have to add is you know for, for many of the groups uh, participating on this call we of course been um, having conversations throughout the pandemic and again encourage as issues come up or you have questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Your input, your feedback is absolutely critical. And on the flip side too, we wanna to best meet uh, your needs and other members of the public too. So thank you very much 
for your help throughout this, your help in the future and participating in today's call. Great, thank you so much for joining us today. That concludes our call.